Okay. Um, as you, as always, we'll talk for as much as we want to talk about, and then we will. Dyslexia is what you have, right? Dyscalculia. Dyscalculia. Calculia. Fuck. Dyscalculia. Okay. Dyscalcula. Dyscalcula. Yeah, I'm there you fuck, go. I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm gonna forget in about two seconds. So I'm gonna say dyslexia, probably because literally that's what I've been saying in my head all day in preparation for this. So, <laughs> and I'll just correct you. There you go. There, exactly. Exactly. It's my disability of not knowing what the fuck everything is. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, as always, I'm going to take a brief break and then we'll jump into this. Okay. Okay. Good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always. And this is a special episode of the show. As you are well aware, we were off all this week, uh, just preparing for the ending of the year. But uh, we wanted to mark today because it is a uh, international day, which we should be talking about. And we're doing that a little bit more on the show. So today, December 3rd, is International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Now, you might be asking, why are you talking about this? Why is this such an important topic to be discussing? Because it is. So hopefully you'll stay with us for the next probably half hour, 45 minutes, depending on how much Kellyanne and I like to talk. But if you've listened to our past episodes, it could be about four hours. So let's go with that. But let's just introduce our guests as I've already done it. But Kellyanne, thank you so much. Our seventh, seventh time doing this on the show. Thank you so much for doing this once again. Thanks for having me. So. I'm going to do a little bit of a brief history of International Day of Persons uh, with Disabilities because I want people to understand why we're doing this and why this day is important. So this is from the United Nations. The annual observance of the International Day of Disability, Disabil Disabled Persons was reclaimed in 1992 by the United Nations General Assembly. It aims to promote the rights and well-being of persons with disabilities in all spheres of society and development and to increase awareness of the situation of persons with disabilities in every aspect of political, social, economic, and cultural life. So the first thing that I'm probably gonna get asked after this airs is why are you doing this? I think we have to break down the stigma that the idea that a person with disabilities is someone physically disabled. It's not the case. There are other dis disabilities that fall under this umbrella. And that's why Kellyanne, our guest today, is on the show. Because there is a disability, and I, I, I don't know if I should use that word, and Kellyanne might correct me after she starts talking for longer than two seconds. But and I'm going to say this right here. Her disability is dyscalculia. Yes. I got it right. Okay, there we go. I was going to say dyslexia, but it's dyscalculia. So I'm going to get Kellyanne to explain to the, our listeners, to our viewers, what dyscalculia means and why it's considered a disability. Kellyanne, whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, dyscalculia is, in its essence, a mathematical-based learning disability. In the broadest sense, it affects my, and I'm not going to speak for everyone who has it, but it really and truly touches on every little piece of my life. So dyscalculia comes from the, it comes from two Greek words, dis meaning bad, calcula meaning math. So it literally translates to bad at math. It's estimated that anywhere between, I believe it's 6% and 9% of the population actually have it. They're just not diagnosed. That's pretty substantial. Um, but the reason why you've probably never heard of it before is because there's been very little research into it until I would say until about 20 years ago. Okay. So that would have been so those are all 2001. my statistics for you. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So understandable. So the reason why we're doing this today is because yet again, we're talking about the United Nations and I have more stats and I, I'm, I'm the stats guy today. I don't know why that, that is going to be the, my role in this, but I'm the stats guy. So 
On December 3rd, so today, during the annual celebration of people with disabilities, the 2021 theme of this year's International Day of Pe Persons with Disabilities is fighting for rights in the post-COVID era. This year, we are celebrating the challenges, the barriers, and opportunities for people who live with disabilities in the context of a global pandemic. So this is perfect time because we are at the end of the fourth wave or middle of the fourth wave or start of the fourth wave, depending on how you look at it here in the province of Alberta. And the question has to be asked, Kellyanne, a person with dyscalculia, has COVID rendered your life harder with that, uh, with that disability? I am, I consider myself very lucky in the sense that it hasn't because um, there has been quite a few resources, um, I would say made available to everyone in the public to help us navigate COVID. For example, when someone says, okay, when we are out shopping, you have to maintain a six foot distance. Don't know what that looks like. Don't know what that means. I know six, I know foot. Put the two together, it's like you're talking Greek to me. Um, luckily, there were arrows and there was cute little sayings. It's the length of a hockey stick. It's the length of a large male moose. <laughs> um, you can tell we're in Canada. <laughs> but I, I, those were really go good support. Those were really good supports for me because it gave me that visual of what six feet looks like. And before we, we'll continue on this topic here for a few seconds before we go into your story of how you figured this, how you figured out your disability, uh, what, what steps you have to do to overcome your disability. So we'll talk about that later on, but I want to stick to this theme of COVID-19 because you said something there and I, I, I'm going to jokingly say it, but I, I mean it in all sincerity. While you have dyscalculia, I think the general public has dyscalculia because I think the general public does not know what six foot means at any day. Uh, I was at the hospital yesterday, which for anyone who's listening to this, I, this was recorded a week prior to airing. Um, and I can tell you, uh, even at the hospital, people were not six feet away, even though there says six feet away. There are signs that say two people per elevator and then yet a family of three gets in with me in it. I'm like, nope. Uh, I, 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 that's my rant for the day. I apologize. There's my rant. For that's the okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back to the UN here for a second to continue sure. on with the statement. Um, this year, International Day of People with Disabilities should be used to recognize that people who live with disabilities are among the most affected populations amid the COVID-19 pandemic, where marginalization, discrimination, vulnerability, and exploration are everyday factors for many people. The increased risk of poor outcomes have been magnified with the reduced access to routine health care and re rehabilitation services. Um, Dyscalcula is something that you, there, there's no doctor for dyscalcula, right? No, there isn't. So this is, this is something you have to deal with on a regular basis by yourself. Yes. So to set up my line of questions about where, where it goes from there, on an average day, how often does your dyscalcula come into effect? Every day. How often? Like, is it like every hour, every five minutes, every every six minutes? Like, I, I'm just, so paint a picture for me because if I'm driving down the road, if you, if, sorry, if you're driving down the road in your car, are there things that you have to do extra because of your dyscalcula? Okay, so this is going to be really funny, but one of these signs of dyscalcula is having a poor understanding of left and right. So when I'm driving, it's not that I'm a danger to anyone on the road. I just want to clarify that I'm not. I have my license. It's all good. My eyes are good. Everything's good. I just have to pay more attention to which way is right and which way is left, or I'm turning the wrong way to work. And it doesn't matter how often I drive. I can drive the exact same route. I still have to think that way. 
I still have to think, okay, let's turn to the left. Which way is left, Kellyanne? And I'll be like, I have to physically, sometimes I'm in my vehicle and I'm physically pointing. I'm going this way. So, so it might not even be math. Math, I mean, math is the main uh, issue for people with dyscalculia, but there are other underlying issues around dyscalculia, right? Absolutely. So let's, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to when Kellyanne was a ye tot six or one foot tall or eight foot tall or three foot tall. I'm not sure how tall you were in grade school, but talk me through the moment when, because I'm assuming you lived with it. So you didn't really know that something was wrong until someone told you something was wrong as in every child's life. So take me through the process of your family figuring out something might be wrong or your school figuring out something might be, I shouldn't say wrong, but there might be a learning disability or a learning uh, hurdle that you might have to overcome. Take me through that. Okay. So it actually, the signs of it were actually very early. Um, I was actually a baby when my mother first noticed that something may not be uh, developing quite correctly in my brain. Um, You know, those puzzles that you can get um, with uh, babies where they have to fit the shape into the corresponding slot? Yeah. So like the cow goes in here, the sheep goes in here. Exactly. I couldn't do that at all. I knew that the cow is black and white and it said moo. I knew that the pig was pink and it said oink, but to put them in their proper place on a cardboard puzzle, could not do it whatsoever. Didn't even want to look at it. You brought out a book. I was sold. Because you couldn't read it? No, I was sold because I loved books. I loved Oh, books. I thought you said you whistled. I was like, what? You whistled? <laughs> I totally, no. I totally don't have a hearing issue as much as people might think because of the radiation and chemo that's coursing through my body. But I swear to God, because of the way that these these podcasts are conducted, I swear to God, she said whistle. <laughs> no, well, no, not whistle, but you brought out a book and I was your child. I would sit attentively and listen and engage, but give me a puzzle. No, want nothing to do with it. So you could comprehend the bigger picture it's just comprehending a lot of the shapes and numbers and sort of things that many people might take for granted uh on a day-to-day basis exactly so okay so now i I might be i might be speaking out of turn here but please please correct me correct me if i'm wrong here most babies what how old were you here probably about five or six i i was probably even younger than that i was an infant so i was maybe a year when the first signs of it showed okay so at a year i'm assuming most families most mothers and fathers are saying maybe she's just slow to learn things it's and that's essentially what my mom thought my mom as we've spoken before is an educator and she understands that children develop at different rates at different times and at their own speed so they didn't pursue like taking me to a pediatrician or to a specialist because all they would have heard was well just give her a little more time and she'll get it and you know what that's totally fair and i don't hold I don't put any blame for that on my parents. They did what they thought was best. So uh, for those who have been watching, uh, you will have seen some movement of my eyes because I, I want, I want, because I, I, I researched the wrong thing before we started this. So I always like to have information beside me. So that way I can talk about this. So I, I'm just on a website right now. And this is uh some random google one that i found so hopefully this is correct as long as it's not wikipedia you're fine there you go so there are common symptoms of dyscalculia Mm -hmm. is sequencing issues yes 
writing when writing reading and recalling numbers mistakes may occur in areas such as number addition subtractions transpositions omissions and reversals yes all of that so I that's that that of. happened to you all the time okay i can't count how many times i reversed addition and subtraction multiplication and division don't know where i went wrong until the teacher points it out because i just don't see it okay difficulty reading maps oh my god you have no idea <laughs> okay we'll get into that difficulty working backwards in time so so what time to leave if needing to be somewhere at x time uh that's not so bad my brain has compensated for that issue don't ask me how but that's i'm pretty good with that and this is the one i find funny because this is number six Difficulty with choreographed dance steps. Do you know how many times, Chris, I used to screw up the YMCA at the school dance? I still do. I, still I can do. never remember the, the arm movements for the Macarena to save my life. And the Macarena has been around since what, 97? So yes. I, I'm looking at some of these and there's a lot more on this list. And I highly, I'll link it in the show notes, the one that I found here. Um, I'm a parent, your, your mother is an educator. So she's looking at you, a person who's struggling with uh, shapes, sort of math and saying, okay, maybe it's just taking a little bit of time to learn. Mm -hmm. So how long after those first indications in her mind, mm -hmm. did she, has she told you, was there a moment in time when she said, okay, there is something wrong. We need to have this potentially, I don't want to say medically looked after because medically might sound like you're pumping her full of drugs, but mm -hmm. have someone uh, sort of investigate into what could potentially be going wrong here. So yeah, there was a bit of a moment. It was actually when we were living in Ontario. Um, Ooh, I was showing Ontario. Muskoka too. So cottage country over here. I know, I know. Um, anyway, um, it, I really started to show further struggle after junior kindergarten, which for everyone else is probably known as grade primary, or maybe it's known as kindergarten. I don't know. Um, I I'm just, in Ontario I living in Alberta it is going to be officially called kindergarten, no matter where I am, because okay. this is my show and it's called kindergarten. Therefore it has been said. Okay. Change so I just, I wasn't showing any improvement from grade one to grade three. I was still struggling to add. I was struggling to subtract. I was struggling with time. I was struggling with, my God, I was struggling with shapes. And I was even struggling with counting money. And that's one of the fundamental skills that you learn in those early years is counting money and how much, what your dime looks like and what a quarter looks like and what's, how much a loony is worth and things like that. Um, so right before we moved back to Nova Scotia, mom and my mom and my dad, my mom and my dad were going to put me in Sylvan Learning Center. But um, that summer, my dad got a new job out east, so we moved back to Nova Scotia. So it was quite it was quite a battle, to be honest. It was a lot of working with my teachers and bringing homework home. And I was getting math books from Santa Claus. I, I don't yeah. have dyscalculia and my father gave me those. Well, Santa gave me those a lot in my stockings. Yeah, there was uh, the last math book I got for Christmas. I was in eighth grade. Okay. And it's sat under my bed. I can imagine, right? Because you're struggling with this and you don't want santa or someone else to push uh learning on you when you're having troubles learning mm -hmm. um so you're in grade eight this is still happening i'm assuming right you're still well like in... when 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 does and i hate to i hate using this word phrase but it's the only phrase that i've ever been able to use on this show but when's the come to jesus moment when's the, the moment When's the moment, sorry, for those who are listening, when's the moment in your life when either a doctor sits you down 
because you could struggle for the rest of your life and no one and like you said there's a lot of people out there who don't know that they're struggling with this so at what point in time does a doctor sit you down does a medical professional sit you down and say kellyanne it's not you it's a disability it's dyscalculia So that actually happened earlier than eighth grade. And I'm really grateful for that because there was a lot of people I met, especially in university that did not have that same luck. It actually happened in fourth grade. I was pulled out for the whole day and I was tested by an educational psychologist for a learning disability. Okay. Um, Now I was at the time I would have just turned 10. So my memory is a little fuzzy. Um, but I do, I can fill in a little bit from what my mother has shared with me. Um, so the testing happened. It went, I mean, it, it went, it was a full day of academic testing, reading, writing, math, comprehension, number signs, number sense, even an intelligence test. Um, and then the school calls in your family or your parents to come in and sit down and talk about it. So Um, This meeting, I wasn't involved in this meeting, so this is all secondhand, Um, but But, both my parents... Sorry to interrupt. Just to talk about that that testing for a second. Are you the only only one in the room during this testing, or are there other kids doing the exact same test? Because I'm picturing a big giant room with like rows upon rows upon rows of desks, where like the teacher comes in and says, you have 18 minutes to finish this test go and then you have to scribble down all that is that what's happening or is it more of a one-on-one uh uh exchange of so eight plus eight equals what the moo cow says what like take me through that process so if you can from remember what I can, yeah so i can so i don't so what i can remember is that it was one-on-one it was actually with the educational psychologist i was the only person in the room next to her and it was that one-on-one of working through, especially the reading and the writing and the math, because those are the main components they look at to assess, partially to assess if you have a disability, um, to see where that weakness was. Um, And it takes the whole day and it's not necessarily an academic test. I wasn't graded on any of this. It was merely testing to, it was testing from the DSM-5. I think it was a DSM-5 back then. Um, to see whether or not I meet the criteria to be diagnosed with a disability. Okay. Okay. And thank God I wasn't graded on any of it because that math was bloody hard. (laughs) I, uh, I couldn't imagine going through that process because I, I, I never had the, I never had to, but Mm -hmm. I, I, this might be a personal question, but you seem like an open book. You always have been on this show. Did you feel like a failure? Yes. How'd you overcome that? Because up until that moment, you are getting, Santa's bringing you math books. You aren't comprehending. And as I said in our pre-interview, you seem like a very person who likes to get things right and you like to get things done correctly. So I can imagine being uh grade four kellyanne mcneil it must have been uh hard on you must have been hard on yourself to say why aren't you getting this i was definitely hard on myself because that's all i heard from my teachers you know i i find that sometimes adults have the perception that kids are resilient um and they're honestly they're really really not i sorry this is a little tricky I want to talk about it because it needs to be talked about but there is that leftover childhood trauma um throughout that throughout my years at that elementary school in Nova Scotia and I'm not going to name the name because that's not how I roll um I was viciously bullied I was um my struggle was made very well known from a very harsh teacher that I had who frequently used me as a scapegoat. And um, I do not have fond memories of that time, no. of that experience, of that school. So uh, let's go into something happier because 
I, sure. I don't I don't want you to have to rehash old things and I, I never try to go down a bad uh, road for any of my guests and you are you are totally the uh, example of this because I want people to enjoy themselves on this show and if you go away from the show like crying then <laughs> I feel shitty afterwards. Chris I, I will say this I've had about 20 years to process and I've written a blog about it I'm not going to go away from the show in tears it's good, um, good, good. this is very talking about it getting the issue out in the open and even bringing up some of the bullying is a way for me to heal it's a way to share with the public that this is this was an isolating experience but you can get through it I know that sounds really cheesy but it's true um so you, you finished the test the, your mother, the educational assistant goes into the room. Yeah. You're basically sitting out there going, okay, either I've passed or I failed. And because that's where I always went. If I have to sit outside and out of a room, I guarantee the first thing is going, either I'm getting a whooping or I'm getting a puppy. Never got a puppy. So that tells you how bad of a student I was. <laughs> so well, I actually, go ahead. just to clarify, I actually wasn't even there in that room. I all heard, I heard all of this secondhand from my mother. No, but uh, okay. Understandable. You weren't actually physically outside the room. You might've been somewhere else, but your mother and the educational assistant have the conversation. Mm -hmm. She then has to tell you because you, you've been living with this. You weren't there when she got the news. How does she break it to you that this is what's happening? You know what? I've been thinking about that moment and I honestly don't remember it. Really? I have no memory. I remember starting my special education classes not long after that, but I have no memory of my parents sitting down with me and saying, hey, Kellyanne, you've got this and you're going to get some extra help for it. Don't have a clue. Huh. Okay. Whether That's... my brain is doing its thing and protecting myself, I don't know, but I actually don't remember that moment. <laughs> okay. But do you remember the first time it, I know you say that you live with it on a day-to-day -day basis and this question might come out of left field, but I'm going to ask it. Do you remember a time after that testing, after finding out and you might not know exactly what day it was or what the words were, but after finding out that you we're able to cope a little bit easier with what was going on because that's, that's always the part in the story that I always find interesting is you now know. And yet again, I hate to go back to the cancer diagnosis, but I'm going to. That's okay. I, I, I remember for a year, a year period uh, in 2019 to 2020, where I was basically passed around from doctor to doctor, trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with me. And in 2020, July 25th, my birthday, I remember the doctor sitting down with me and saying, you have cancer. And there was a moment of relief where I went, finally, someone has told me what it is. Let's get it out of me. Let's start this process. What was that moment for you when you said, you know what? I just calcula. I need a little bit longer than with this information and I'm okay with asking for it. I was in high school when that happened. Okay. I was getting, I was actually getting ready to go to university and I had been retested for dyscalculia because um, I was with fresh, with the new test, I was able to be accommodated in university. Mm -hmm. So I remember being really brave. I sat down at our family computer because that's the way it was when I was in high school. And I Googled math learning disability. I didn't know what I was gonna find. And I was scared out of my mind because of that. I was scared it was gonna be something. I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I was just generally scared. And I'm reading through that, like that symptom list you just read through Chris. And I'm like, holy crap, this actually makes sense. I had never put a name to it. I just had a learning disability. That's the only thing it was called as I was growing up. It was only in high school when I found out that it was actually called dyscalculia. 
it was actually more common than we think. And here's the signs and symptoms that you have. That was my moment. I was 18. What sense of relief was that? I know it's, it sounds like a weird question, but the moment you, 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 you're able to name it, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it takes away the power of not knowing and it gives it to you again, because you now can say, dyscalculia, F off, stop fucking trying to do this to me. Like, I'm going to take my time and try, I will overcome this because it is a hard thing to overcome. How much of a relief was that? It was huge because I finally felt like I could explain it to other people. I finally, and I finally could explain it to myself, like all of the little quirks and the things that just didn't make any sense to me, all of a sudden, everything just clicked. All of a sudden, I knew why I can't remember my friggin' bank pen to save my life. Why left and right and driver's ed was so hard to get the hang of. And most importantly, why for the life of me, I could not count change at my part-time job. Yeah, that, that would suck. I just as to clarify, I wound up getting fired from that part-time job for that reason. I, I got fired. Well, not, not to play apples and oranges here, but ah, come on, we got to from top to side. I got fired from a farm for eating more strawberries than I picked. <laughs> That's something I would do, man. No there, shame in that. Oh, exactly. I got fired after a day. One day. <laughs> <laughs> so happy about that job. Um, so I, I, I want to go back here for a second because of course you now know it, right? But mm -hmm. there are people listening to the show in this episode who might say, what are some of the actual, the, like a young child with, like as a young child, if I have a child who might have this, what are the signs that I should be looking for? I'm going to read this off from the Child's Mind Institute, which is a young child with dyscalculia may have dis difficulty recognizing numbers, mm -hmm. be delayed in learning to count, struggle to mm -hmm. connect numerical symbols with their corresponding words, have difficulty recognizing patterns and placing them, placing things in order. Mm -hmm. Lose track when counting. All the time. And need to use visual aids like fingers to help count. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing. Now, I will say this as well, because there is a big line here that I want to make sure. So Kellyanne at the top of the interview, she said that there's roughly, I think you said five to seven percent of people in the world. Six, six to nine, five to seven. Okay. So somewhere along those lines. I, I'm gonna read this on this is yet again on the Child Blinds Institute. It's from the government of the U USA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how common is this calculus? Though research uh, on prevalence is limited, it's estimated that between 5 to 7% of elementary school aged children have dyscalculia. It is also currently thought dis that dyscalculia occurs equally in both men and women. So this is not just a woman's disability. It is a men no, and women's issue. All. And now here's the big thing. We just read that list of uh, potential what to look for if your child has might have dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. They say that this is not the official word. While you might have difficulty recognizing numbers, be delayed in learning to count, struggle to connect numerical symbols, that does not mean you have dyscalculia. It just means you have a chance of having dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. So if you do think that your child might have it, like Kellyanne, reach out to an educational assistant. Reach out to someone who knows a little bit more and might be able to help you because this show is not the be all end all of what you should be doing. And please, 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 please do not take our word for like God, because it is not. We are just here to have a conversation about uh, person, International Day of Persons with Disability and Dyscalculia. So there's my, there's my TED talk for the day. Thank you for coming. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs> so let's, so let's jump into 
2021 Kellyanne McNeil with Dyscalculo. Sure. Um, you, you talked about how the uh, COVID-19, six feet apart, two meters, uh, throws you for a loop because you know the words, you understand the numbers, you just can't visualize it. And again, a lot of people can't, and I get pissed off at them, but that's here nor there. How do you overcome your day-to-day -day working uh, work to ensure that it doesn't creep up on you? Because it must be hard. Like the average task for me might take you a little bit longer to do, correct? Like if I'm going out grocery shopping, I say, I have a $50 limit. I know how much money is in my basket because I can spend $50. So, and I can add up those numbers in my head. For you, is it a lot harder to do grocery shopping? And do you just go, I just, I spend what I spend and hope for the best that I don't break the bank? Um, yeah, that's essentially my method. Um, so one of the, or I don't want to call it a thing, but it's a thing. One of the things with this disability is I can't do mental math. Okay. I can add 15% or not 15%. It's not 15% out here. I can't add 5% tax onto my total. I just don't know how to do that. It's been shown to me half a dozen times. I have, it just doesn't stick. Um, so to compensate for that, uh, Walmart out in beautiful Slave Lake now has online ordering. So I can see, I know my budget in my head. I can put that much in my cart and I go from there. That's how I overcome it. So in sense, and I hate to use this way, but COVID-19 has kind of helped you, uh, in, in essence, because you are now not feeling, and I don't want to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth that might feel embarrassed to go to the uh, grocery store or somewhere and say, okay, I have to do basic math in my head. It's not going to happen. Okay. Just hope to God that this doesn't cost more than I can afford this month. <laughs> wow. I guess when you look at it that way, yeah. COVID-19 kind of helped with that. I, I always try to look at the silver lining, Kellyanne. You know that, you know, you, I do. you I know do. me, you know me. I um, do. So where does this go? Where do you go from here? Because I can imagine being someone uh, with a disability, a learning disability is hard in today's society because I will be honest, you, you have told me that you've had dyscalculia for, I think like literally the very first episode that we ever talked on the show, you, you mm -hmm. opened up about it because you've been open about it. And I think I, I said the exact same thing that I'm going to say now. Huh? Is that real? Because I think there is a misconception. And this is where we're getting back to. So if you followed along for the last 40 minutes, you are now getting to the point. <laughs> and that point is, persons with disability does not mean what you think it means. It really doesn't. A person with a disability means what? I mean, it means, for me, it's all about image. And I know that sounds very um, juvenile, but it is. I've constantly been faced with people saying, but you don't look like you have a disability. And then I look back, I just think in my head, well, what am I supposed to look like? <laughs> like, do I have to walk around with a big calculator on my head so it makes you look like I have a Honest disability? Honest to God, Chris, you'd think that sometimes. Do you still get but, that though? Uh, Oh yeah. Do you get people who don't understand it when you open up to them about it? Like me, like, I'll be honest, I didn't understand it. So I learned about it and I learned about the wrong thing today, but I, I've learned through process of talking to you a little bit more about it and mm -hmm. the struggles that you've gone through. Do you, okay, now this is, this is gonna be the insensitive comment for anyone who's listening, who's about to send me an email, the comment or feedback, I appreciate it. Go to crossborderinterviews.ca, leave your feedback. It will be filed in the appropriate location. 
Kellyanne, your disability is not visual. You cannot no. see that you get by by you can get by on a day-to-day basis without people understanding that you have a disability. Yep. Do you feel embarrassed from time to time that when you come out to people, and I say that as in like you talk about your disability openly, that people don't think it's a disability? Because I, I can imagine people going, oh, it's just you're, you have trouble with math. Who cares? Everyone does. And then goes about like, do you get that sense that people might not think it's a true disability, even though it is? Yeah, I've actually, that actually happened to me with someone I had a crush on in university. Oh, wow. Um, We were out on an innocent coffee date and he, this particular individual had a sibling who had and he came out and said oh my sibling has autism he's on the spectrum and I thought here's someone that's going to understand so I opened up to him and he proceeded to say oh well it's just you just have math anxiety and it's more than yeah yes I have math and trust me there is anxiety surrounding math but that's because my brain functions differently when it's facing a mathematical calculation or project planning or budgeting or making a flipping puzzle. So needless to say, that changed my perception of that particular person. I can imagine so too. Mm -hmm. Do you... Ask. No, and I, I, no, and I just, it's, it, it's, <laughs> it's my brain not working properly right now. And I, I, I understand, I know what the question is. I just need to find the word because I'm ha- like uh, with radiation and where my cancer is on my brain it has issues with and a lot of my interviews are like this right now where I have asking oh, questions. I didn't realize that. Oh, my apologies. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. You have been open about this since I've known you. It is something that five to seven, six to nine percent of the people of Canada or the world are dealing with, but it's not talked openly. Do you hope that people start talking openly about? mm, Okay, I've painted myself into a corner here, but I'm going to say, do you feel like people need to start talking about all disabilities, not just physical disabilities or mental disabilities, but all disabilities, learning disabilities, and make it more apparent that people have disabilities that you may not, you, you they might be your neighbor, they may be your coworker, and you may not know it, but you might have to take a step back and say, okay, how can I help? I really wish more people were like that. Um, That's not to say there aren't people like that out there. I would say about 99% of the people I meet are so much more open than I thought they were because there's still that ingrained fear for me of failure and being bullied for it like I was those 20 plus years ago. Now, that being said, there is the opposite and there are people out there in particular i met one of them a few years ago um that will never understand what you're going through and i feel like that is the case for most for most people Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. 
By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. If there's one thing that you could let our listeners know who might be struggling with dyscalculia, who might be a parent with someone uh, of a child with the dyscalculia, what would you want them to know? Because you went through it. You saw sometimes getting a Santa uh, stuck, uh, stuffing your stocking with a math book might not be the most fun thing or most uh most appropriate uh, gift that Santa might leave under your table, but he did, uh, in your stocking, sorry, but he did. What would you tell the parent? What would you tell the child who's struggling with it, who's listening to this right now? I would first say that it's not your child's fault. They have no idea what's going on in their brain. They don't understand why they don't understand when everyone else is. To the child itself if oh my goodness i would say so much first off i would make sure they know that they're not a failure for one thing i was never told outright told i was a failure but my the educators i had subtly um what's the word i'm looking for now subtly i ingrained that into me and i want to reassure every single child who's facing this you're not a failure you can succeed in whatever you put your mind to because i have i'm not gonna i'm gonna make i I, chris is my witness (laughs) i'm a witness I'm i'm gonna make the plug here chris and i hope you don't mind um i was told by multiple educators that I wouldn't amount to a lot. That was the impression that I received as a young child. I'm now sitting in an apartment, living on my own with a master's degree from an, Canada's version of an Ivy League school. Not the best one, but still an Ivy League. I'll give it to you. I'll Simmer it. on <laughs> down there, buddy. I'll give it Simmer to you. On down. I'll give it to you. Us scales will always fly together. We we Queens boys, we love our Queens. And no matter what, we will always, always stick up to be the Queen boys. And I will always, always be a McGill Mart- Martlet. I think that's the thing. I think that's their mascot. Anyway, but I, I had to overcome a lot. I struggled a lot. There was a lot of insensitive things that were said to me over time. But they just fueled my fire. I was told in grad school, I was better off failing a class than pushing through and doing it. And I passed that class with a B plus. Good for you. So those kids aren't failures. Do, uh, I, I, not to interrupt, but uh, I always, whenever someone told me I shouldn't do something or you're a failure, you're not going to achieve it it made me work harder. It made me work faster. It made me learn more. It made me read more. It made me want to come back to them a year from then and say, screw you. I did it backwards and in high heels. And you can't take that away from me, you son of a gun. And that's basically what happens to me. Um, I never... I mean, that's not to say I didn't have my moments of crisis. I certainly did when I wanted to just throw in the towel and give up. And my mother can speak to that because nine times out of 10, I wound up calling her in tears. So there we go. Um, But um, you can call me whenever you want. You don't want to commit to that until you know what's what I look like when I'm melting down. Anyway. Anyway, that's a whole other issue. Um, but when I was, when I'm told I can't do something, I'm sorry. That's just, can't is not in my books. It's just not anymore. When, 
I don't, I have, ex, I have some extended family members who have underestimated me my whole life and I've blown them out of the water. So it, it's not about can't, it's not for me anyway, it, it's not that, it, what am I trying to say? Can't is not in my vocabulary anymore. Even though you just said it there, but I understand the meaning behind that. <laughs> okay, Deadpool, calm down. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds has nothing on me. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for opening up, being honest, being truthful. Uh, it's always hard to talk about a disability openly, especially on the record. Um, I think that Kellyanne, you, as I've said numerous times throughout the, the our, our budding friendship that we have, you are an amazing human being slash person, and you will do amazing things no matter where you are. And I know for a fact that no matter where you are and where I am in this world, there will always be a special episode every December until this podcast is gone on this podcast with your name on it. So Kellyanne. Well, I, I love that. I love that so much. And we, no matter where we both are, are always going to be friends, are always going to be travel buddies. Until you and bring up McGill. Gonna... I just, I don't think I could. <laughs> like, I think my queen's card is getting revoked right now. Well, they should give it back to you because I said so. So there you go. There you go. But no, I, I truly appreciate everything you do for the uh, for the Discalcula community. I appreciate you being open. Uh, your blog is amazing. I haven't seen any new posts lately since the big move of this year because she had some prior work commitment. So it kind of probably took. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I will say this. Um, Kellyanne, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, for everyone who's tuned in today, I want to say thank you for listening to us rant for the last 50 minutes. But I also want to take a moment and say there's a link in the show notes to the United Nations uh, International Day of Persons with Disability link, which gives you the history, which gives you the background information that you will need, and then also uh, the link to the Child Mind Institute, which has uh, information on Dyscalcula by a Ray Jacobson. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I think I am. So I, I highly recommend you look them up, research, do some information, and just enjoy yourself because you need to learn and you need to talk to people. So Kellyanne, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, as I always do on my night pitches or my after, after the interview pitches, uh, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below. Bam, in the YouTube channel. If you are listening to this via the audio, hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you get the show. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter because we do have some always behind the scenes information and Instagram if you like to see selfies of me after cancer treatments or during random other things that happen to the show during the, pro during the off days. Um, and then also, if you like the show and you're considering backing it, head over to Patreon uh, backslash cross border interviews and donate donate two three dollars it helps the show continue and we want to bring you great new things next year and i i highly recommend that you stay tuned because january 2nd we have a big huge announcement that we're going to be releasing here i'm actually looking forward to it because we are going to be changing things up in season four and we're going to be announcing it in january so stay tuned uh monday we are back with another great full week of shows and then the following week is our last week of 2021 and then on December, I think I'm going to get this wrong here, but December 29th, we have our look back with our panel, which Kellyanne McNeil will be back for her eighth time with Char Vetch and Mitchell Nielsen. 
uh, as of recording this, they do not know this, but I held them to account to be on the show once again. So they will be back. So with that, everyone, have yourself an excellent rest of your Friday. Stay safe. Keep talking. and.